What's up, everyone, and welcome back to the Boost Your Biology podcast. I'm super excited because today we have a very special guest who is a functional medicine expert. Joining me on the show, we have Leyland Stillman. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. So maybe do you want to start out with uh, letting my listeners know a little bit about your journey? I mean, you're, you're very passionate about functional medicine and optimizing human health. Do you want to share with my listeners a bit about your story? Well, I think, uh, you know, another word for what I am is obsessed. I'm very obsessed with what I do. And I've been obsessed with what I do since I was about 14 or 15. Um, my sister and I had, you know, the sort of bread and butter medical problems of kids in, you know, America when we were growing up, that was the early nineties, ear infections, tonsil problems, you know, uh, sore throats, runny noses, stuffy noses, et cetera. My mom tells this really funny story where my sister was recovering post-operatively from surgery for a sinus infection and she's vomiting into this emesis space and she's like two years old, right? And, or something like that. She's really young. And my mom looks up at the surgeon and she says, we fixed the problem, right? We're never going to have to do this again, right? And the surgeon says, oh no, the, the surgical holes we've drilled will, will close up again and we'll probably have to go in and reoperate. And at that moment, my mother said, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. This is not what I signed up for. And she basically then took us to like every different type of healer I could possibly imagine. D dowsers, cranial sacral therapists, chiropractors, doctors of Chinese medicine, oriental medicine, however you want to call that. Um, I mean, just the whole nine. We did some really wacky out there stuff. And I was fascinated. And as I got older, you know, my dad was the opposite. He was the guy who said, we can't give the kids melatonin to help them sleep because it is not like FDA approved, right? <laughs> <laughs> like melatonin. I use mel doses of melatonin, probably 10, a hundred, maybe yeah. even a thousand fold what I was like given as my, my mother as a child, right? Now as a doctor. So totally different approaches from my parents. And that gave me a real appreciation for there's like a lot out there, right? Mm. And you know, what are we going to actually use? Because there's only so many hours in the day. There's only so much room in your medicine cabinet. You know, we got to figure out what works here, right? And that's what integrative medicine is really all about. And that's, you know, I mean, we slice and dice all these num names of, of what I do, integrative, functional, natural, holistic, whatever. At the end of the day, good medicine is good, net good medicine. And I, I, uh, I went to medical school because my mentor, who's a naturopath, said, You'll get the biggest licensure. You'll be able to use everything like naturopaths, chiropractors, you know, they can't really prescribe a lot of things. So go get the biggest hunting license you can, and then, <laughs> you know, pick and choose what you want to do. So I did that and hated medical school, just load the whole process. It was so incredibly, I mean, asinine medical school was asinine. There were really mm. fascinating moments and times and and whatever, but it was just, I mean, you know, it's turning out doctors that people don't want to see and who don't really know how to think and who don't deliver good results for their, their patients. So then I got out of medical school, finished my residency, which was similarly unpleasant and, uh, started to practice and trying to figure out what actually really worked. And, uh, that's kind of the short version, I guess. And mm. now I do a whole lot of different things, but mostly what I focus on in my practice is getting people's lifestyles dialed in from when they wake up to, you know, what they have for breakfast to how they go through their day, little things like, okay, you're stuck in this office. How can we fix your lighting environment so that it's not as bad as it is? Um, you know, and then supplements. So we focus a lot on minerals, vitamins, using very clear dosing to fix deficiencies and optimize metabolic function. And then we do, uh, we do a lot of, you know, what I think I can only describe as like life coaching, cause it's not really therapy or counseling, but we try and help our people to understand how stress is playing a role in their illness because a lot of mm. them, that's the biggest problem that they actually face, you know, mm. stress from the way they were brought up, trauma, you name it and helping them put that in context and then find strategies to mitigate th that stress so that it isn't creating so much disease in their lives. Mm. Now I noticed that in your Instagram bio, um, 
you mentioned there's a quote there that I really like, and that is the greatest medicine of all is teaching people how not to need it. Um, so this is going to be very pertinent to our discussion today around some of the um, strategies and, and, and things that people can implement to optimize their health. Um, mm. So maybe do you want to sort of expand upon, you know, why does that resonate? How does that resonate with you? It's a great question. So I found that quote, I can't remember how long ago, it must be three or four years now. But I remember reading it and thinking, yes, this is the greatest medicine of all. This is obvious. Mm. How is it that I've been a doctor for many, <laughs> not that many, but you know, three, four, five years at least. I'm going to be in my 10th year of practice in you know, nine or 10 months. How am I only just coming across this? Why isn't this chiseled in stone across the you know, the mantle or the, the, the door of every medical school in the world, mm. because the real goal of the physician should be to restore the patient to a state of health. That's really found it founded upon their diet and their lifestyle. And these words are so interesting because people don't read the history of words. The history of, of the word diet actually goes back to ancient Greece and it's described as one's way of daily living not just what you eat. And it's wow. also specifically a, a physician prescribed way of living. That's what diet mm. is supposed to be. And uh, yeah, so I, th that just became sort of the thing I was chasing and still am, right? How mm. do I teach people how not to need medications? How do I teach them how not to need supplements? You know, for better or for worse in our modern world, it's very hard to live without some hacks, some cheat codes, you know, I have plenty of supplements on my shelf. I just think I'm a lot more uh, judicious and conservative with them than most people. And I'm very clear with patients when I say, look, some people you're going to go to are going to put you on like 20, 30, 40 supplements at a time. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to spell out and we're going to talk about the benefits of each one. I'm going to try to teach you how to do this with food because I really do believe that food should be your your first medicine. If, you, if I can tell someone how to do something with a supplement or sorry, with a food rather than a supplement, I'll do it. But you'll get people who need high doses of things like zinc, chromium, manganese, selenium. How are you going to get that much of that mineral into the, into the system uh, without a supplement? And that's where the supplementation becomes really invaluable for getting people better faster. Mm. With that, I mean, you mentioned a uh, you know, really important point around diet. Um, there's another quote, which is, uh, well, something that I've used before, which is, um, the best diet is a diet that you don't even know you're on. <laughs> um, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe do you want to sort of expand upon, you know, over the years as a, as a practitioner yourself, I mean, mm -hmm. when it comes to dietary interventions and nutrition, where do you think most people really struggle when it comes to nutrition? So I like to point out to people that we're the only animal on planet earth that eats a non-local non-seasonal diet and argues about what to eat. <laughs> right. It's really funny. You know, and I sometimes also joke, I'm like, look, we're smart enough to completely dominate the face of the planet earth, but not smart enough to do it gracefully. Right. Hmm. It's like a little bit embarrassing being human sometimes. Right. And the whole diet thing is a little bit like that because, you know, when you look at, but, but, but to me, diet now, it, it goes back to the fact that even the word diet, it is, it is not just what you put in your mouth. It is a way of living because how you live is integral to how you eat. You know, if, if you have somebody who, let's say that they start fishing and they're going out and they're surf casting here in Florida. People are fishing from the beach every day. I go down there every day, every morning with my coffee. There's, you know, a one guy probably every hundred yards surf casting. If you say start eating more fish that you're catching surf casting and you see your health improve, you might think, oh, it's because I'm eating fish and fish are good for me. But you're missing the point that you're outside, you're connected to the earth, you're relaxing, you're doing one of the most highly conserved, but also somewhat, I mean, even sort of like addictive. I don't know if you have this in, in Australia, but in the United States, people will joke about how sort of addicted they are to fishing, you know, 
sort of like, oh, women will be like, oh, you know, my, we live in a nicer house, but my husband likes fishing too much. Or, you know, <laughs> my husband was going to get me a nice gift or whatever, but instead he bought a new fishing rig or fishing pole or whatever, things like that. So, you know, you're going out there, you're doing this thing that your brain really, really loves. It's sort of meditative, right? Um, there's a reason men love to fish. And you're getting all these benefits, sunlight on your skin, sunlight in your eye. You're, you may be doing a little bit of exercising, right? If you catch a big enough fish and all of that is giving you a health benefit. So people will say like, aha, I started eating more fish and I got better, but really you started eating more fish and you got outside to do it. Not the same, right? Um, that's one of the big problems I have with people who look at diets of different people and they say, oh, well, you know, the Inuit or the Eskimo, they eat this way and they have no heart disease. So we should all eat that way. And then we have a no heart disease. And I'm like, yeah, they also, you know, go fishing for seals in the cold, frigid waters of Alaska or Greenland or wherever they are. And they will catch seals and they will literally pull the seal into the boat with them. And then they will open its arteries and they will drink its blood. Are you going <laughs> to do that too? And they're like, well, no, I'm just going to buy some sockeye salmon at the grocery store. And then maybe, you know, at a real reach, they may get some elk or something like shipped to them, right? And I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to criticize them just to be clear, but people try to divorce their diet from their lifestyle mm. and it's silly. It's an obvious mistake that people, when you point it out to them, they say, yeah, you know, I can see why that makes sense, but I've been shocked. And this is one of the real disillusioning moments for me in the integrative health space is you go to these conferences, right? They're like all the other conferences doesn't matter if you're talking about big box conventional medicine conferences or like big pharma conferences or whatever kind of conference, right? It's integrative medical practitioners in these big hotels with these big conference rooms, these big fluorescent lights, these big artificially lit screens with, you know, displays and presentations and whatever. These people have no appreciation for sunlight. They never hmm. talk about how important it is. They don't talk about circadian rhythms. They don't talk about photobiomodulation. They don't talk about any of this stuff. And it was very disillusioning to me to start going to these events that I'd been actually looking forward to going to for my entire medical career. Residency, medical school, like oh, I just can't wait until I can really go ahead and blow two grand on the A4M conference that's going to be at, you know, the the Venetian in in LA, or not LA, <laughs> Las Vegas. And, and I'm I Shouldn't have singled them out. I like that conference. It's actually one of the best conferences for my space out there. But you go and it's like, okay, you know, you guys could have a more interesting, um, like I will, I looked this year and I thought, I don't want to go to this. I don't know what they're talking about. None of these in sessions interest me. What happened? Because I'm fascinated by what I do. I, I'm so like in love with what I do. And the idea that you could put together a conference about what I do and make it not that interesting to me is pretty shocking, in my opinion. Mm. So, um, yeah, yeah. Does that help? Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think what would be useful is, um, I mean, definitely frames it in in the in that light in terms of um, you know, structuring nutrition. I mean, over the years, even yourself. I mean, mm. how has your lens on nutrition evolved in, uh, yeah. over time. Yeah. <clears throat> so we have to start by understanding that we humans cheat a lot. We cheat a lot. When people are like saying things, well, we all ought to eat like this or like that, or like, you know, people will say things like, well, the lions all eat, you know, a carnivorous diet, so we should all be carnivores. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, lions don't, mm, you know, skin their prey and then cure the hides and then make that into clothing and then migrate into like, you know, Northern Russia. <laughs> so I can see why you want me like draw these analogies in nature, right? And say, well, in nature, it's this way. So we should do it that way. I'm like, yeah, but humanity always cheats. We do things like make fire and we make clothing and we make structures and shelter and whatever. So we cheat a lot. You just have to understand how that cheating and, you know, you might call it biohacking if you want to make it fancy, but you got to understand how that affects your biology. So when you move into an indoor structure with fluorescent lighting and all of a sudden you're um, not getting any infrared, not getting any red light, you're um, in a temperature controlled environment, you're not sweating, there's no cold stress, right? All of that reduces those stresses on your biology. Cold, 
heat stress, these have positive health benefits, right? At least in, in some measure, right? You can overdo anything. Uh, the same thing's true of the red and infrared light, right? I mean, those things have very powerful healing properties. So if you're going to do that, it makes sense to then build in some time in your day to introduce these red and infrared frequencies into your life. Maybe you buy a sauna space sauna and you make 20 to 30 minutes as part of your evening routine to wind down and go to sleep. Maybe you put a, you know, one of their photon bulbs on your desk. Like I'll use this at my desk regularly. Um, mm. Maybe you get like an EMR tech firestorm like that one and you put it on your desk and you, you know, you use some red light therapy during the day, whatever it is that you do, you want to be mindful of, okay, what's my natural environment and how does, how does that going to affect me? And this is the other thing, right? Is like the things you need to compensate for the stresses of your environment depend on the environment. So let's say that you're going to live in rural Nicaragua and you're going to spend a lot of time outside doing manual labor. What's well, really hot, it's really dry. You're going to need a lot of water and you're going to lose a lot of sweat. So you're going to need a lot of salt, right? So I'm not going to make the same salt recommendation to an 89 year old retiree in Minnesota, who's, you know, asking me how much salt she should consume in January, as I'm going to a construction worker in, you know, Nicaragua at the same time of year, right? So you have to keep mm. these stresses in mind. And this is where I think so many nutrition and fitness professionals go wrong is they're not focused on the whole picture. And we'll often see this, we'll see that people like, let's say that someone's macros are just spot on. I mean, they're eating the perfect macros for them. They're getting enough protein. They got a good mix of carbs. They're using a nice mix of different resistant starches versus simple starches. You know, they've got nice fats. They've got a good fatty acid profile, whatever you want to call that. Right. But then you look at their micronutrient density and they've got low potassium, low magnesium, high calcium, high sodium. That's a setup for high blood pressure. Right. Which is also a setup for metabolic disorders and diseases. So. Mm you start to see these things and then you can't unsee them. And then you think, okay, I really need to get more. And this is why you and I both I mean, gravitated towards coaching because when you don't have time with people, you really can't tailor solutions to them. And you mm -hmm. can make a course that's one size fits all, but how do you make a one size fits all course for people in radically different locations and situations, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. Yeah. I definitely, um, with that, You've made, made some, you know, really exceptional points around, um, you know, different environments and factoring in the individualization mm -hmm. um, as it pertains to nutrition. What about the the impact of um, where people are sourcing their info, where where people are sourcing their nutritional information from? How, how does that? Uh, how do you think that affects their their ability to make decisions? Wow. <laughs> it's a great question, but it's a question with a double meaning that I don't think you intended. <laughs> so I actually, I actually was listening to this podcast by a guy named Jabe Campbell the other day. He was talking to a food nutrition biochemist about peptides in food and how those peptides can have oh, yeah. an effect on your physiology. Have you heard about this? Is this Jay, Jay Campbell interviewed an expert on? Yeah, I can't remember it, the expert's name. Wasn't Saladino? Um, I'll was try it? and find it for the show notes. But, um, yeah, he was talking about how peptides in food can affect your, your physiology. And I thought, oh my gosh, I never thought about it that way. But when you really think about it, food in a way is information. Your body uses food as nutrients or as, as sort of raw material to do things. Mm. But what if your food, your brain says, oh, wow, there's not a lot of folate around you're not going to find a lot of folate in cold, dark places. And fun fact, folate is degraded by ultraviolet and blue light. It's so powerfully degraded by these frequencies that when you hang it in the hospital as an IV, you have to hang it with a brown paper or brown plastic bag around the vial so it doesn't degrade the folate before it gets into the patient's body. So isn't wow. it interesting that in high folate environments or high, high light environments, the equator warm places, summer uh, environments or seasons, you have a high, high abundance of folate rich foods available, right? Mm. Little things like that make me think, and there's very little literature on this. Not a lot of people are interested in this like I am, but you'll see these associations of these people who feel terrible and they're out in the sun all the time and then boom, 
their folate pathways off because they're not eating any folate because they didn't realize that it was a hole in their diet. So, um, so the information about their food is very interesting because, and I use, do you use an app called chronometer? Yeah. Chronometer. Yep. To chronometer, assess chronometer, whatever, <laughs> potato, potato, <laughs> tomato, tomato. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we use chronometer with our coaching clients and I have a medical practice and a coaching practice for people who are curious because we practice medicine for where I'm practicing medicine where I'm licensed. Cause I don't want to go to jail and I'm coaching people where I'm not licensed and hopefully they won't throw me in jail for that. So anyway, um, with chronometer, it has all this nutritional data about micronutrient, macronutrient content in food. That's if you actually look at, I just was reviewing this literature, our soils and therefore our food have been massively demineralized in the last few hundred years. Uh, I had some great papers that I quoted on a, a, a I do this Monday masterclass um, every Monday almost uh, with rare exceptions. And the Monday masterclass is always on a different topic that I'm interested in. It's at three o'clock on my YouTube channel if people want to watch it. And in this Monday masterclass, I went through some papers where we looked at the amount that minerals have declined in our soil in, in content and it's shocking. And this was a paper, by the way, from 2007 and the latest data they were re referencing was 2002. And we're talking about, you know, wow. 50, 60, 70% declines. And that was just from like 1940 something. Right. And we'd already seen a lot of, you know, crop hybridization and changes in farming. And the first pesticides were introduced in the mid 1800s. Most people don't realize that they were actually arsenic and lead based compounds. A great book on that is the moth and the iron lung by a guy named Forrest Meredy. He goes through the whole history of how pesticide use started with heavy metals back in the 1800s. Um, mm. It was very crude chemistry. It, it led to a lot of poisonings, um, which is why that book is so interesting. But yeah, I mean, then you look at this other paper that I looked at, it was, it was actually from a, um, the world's longest running agricultural experiment. It was started in like 1840 something in like Rothamsted, UK. And they were looking at cultivars of wheat from that period, the 1800s, mid 1800s, and comparing them with modern dwarf varieties of wheat. And just by changing the wheat cultivar from the old one to the new one without changing anything about the soil, you get a massive drop in mineral content. So we have all mm. these different forces. Basically the consumer is pushing farmers to make more food. And the easiest way for farmers to make more food, to make more money is to make the food more dilute and to add water weight and add, you know, basically nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, which is what NPK, the majority of our fertilizers are. And in those NPK fertilizers, I actually just found this out. It turns out that when they mine some of the minerals to make these fertilizers, there's heavy metals in the mineral deposits Jeez. that then go into the soil. So you're getting lower levels, but non-zero levels of these heavy metals that are toxic in small quantities. So mm -hmm. yeah, the nutritional information that you're getting is very, it's very, um, it's very interesting. And I've been doing mm -hmm. a lot of hair tissue mineral analysis in my medical practice recently. That's really changed the way I look at this because it's a very good marker for long-term toxic exposures to heavy metals. Mm. I started experimenting with this, frankly, about a year ago. And my eyes bugged out of my head when I got one of my first tests back. It was on a longtime patient of mine who had been struggling with headaches for a long time. We'd gotten her a lot of progress. But I get this result back and her aluminum level is like 135. And on the little piece of paper that the report comes back on, the normal range is like zero to four. Jeez. <laughs> so she's like 25, 30 fold, the upper limit that you see on this paper. And that's when I thought, wow, what am I going to find if I, if I study all my other patients? And that's when mm. I started to realize the burden of heavy metals that you can provoke from people with the right mineral balancing protocol is shocking. And you get these waves of heavy metals coming out of people as they feel better, right? And as they detox. And uh, it's really woken me up to how big of a problem the contamination of our soils is, because that's where a lot of these things are coming from. In addition to mm. air and water pollution and consumer products, I mean, you know, the stuff people put on their skin is just shocking sometimes what it contains. Mm. That was going to be my next question for you, which was around... Um in regards to being a 
practitioner slash coach slash influencer or someone that's you know wanting to make change in a positive direction mm. positive way um as it pertains to functional testing versus you know because i'd imagine you, you've had a number of clients over the years that are like wanting to get every single test under the sun done um so, yes. so how do you leverage you know objective data functional testing alongside their symptom picture the most important thing is to figure out where the person already is because mm. the simple fact of the matter is you'll get people in who say look i'm not sleeping well and when i say they're not sleeping well let me be clear they're staying up late they're scrolling through their phone they're on social media they're binge watching youtube they're playing video games they're and then they say you know and then i'm eating junk food i you know i go out for fast food you know seven times a week and I go out for, you know, dinner, you know, a couple times a week with work colleagues and I have a couple cocktails here and there. And then I have a nightcap when I get home and then, you know, it's like, okay, well, we got a lot of obvious low hanging fruit here that we can pluck off the tree before we go chasing fancy lab tests. But the other thing about that is that people won't realize that, you know, they come in and they're like, I know I need to change a bunch of things about my lifestyle to achieve my goals, but I don't want to, but I just want to get the lab test. And when we get the lab tests, often we've just, in some ways we've wasted the money because they, because I'm not going to say no to them because I also appreciate the fact that a lot of people, they need the psychological impact of seeing the numbers. They need to see that the numbers are bad to be kind. And that's okay. It's okay. But I am very clear with them. I'm like, look, we can do this kind of two ways. We can just get all the data and see what's going on. Or you can you know, do it the way I recommend, which is we get your diet and your lifestyle in some semblance of order. Uh, we get you some good habits, some foundational habits that we know are going to move the needle for you, even if, you know, regardless of what your lab testing shows. And mm. then we get the lab testing because then we're going to know what it actually means, right? Like if somebody's mm. glutathione level is terrible, but they're having you know, two cocktails a night and they're eating processed food and they're not getting enough protein and they're not getting any sunlight and they don't do any photobiomodulation or sauna or whatever. Well, I got a half a dozen reasons right there why the glutathione may be low. So why am I going to test it? Right. Um, mm. yeah. And likewise, a lot of people are looking for the testing because they don't want to engage with a lifestyle change, but that just doesn't end well. You really have to be willing to engage in changing some of your habits, your choices, if you want to get durable, significant results, because the only other alternative is basically you resort to fancy tricks and gimmicks in order to um, sort of let the party last a little longer. Um, and I have a, there's a place for that. You know, you have somebody who says, look, I'm closing a multi-million dollar deal. I got two months left to do it please just prop up my physiology so I can, you know, make <laughs> enough money to retire on the beach. I'm like, you know, that might not be my first recommendation for you, <laughs> but I get it. Right. I totally get it. So, okay, here's, here's the game plan. Here's how we do that. Right. Um, but that's always a, you know, a real clear conversation with the patient because, you know, they, or the client in the coaching capacity, because, you know, people just don't, a lot of them need someone to talk to them about what their life is really supposed to be about. Cause it's, mm. you know, the things they're chasing are not making them happy and they're certainly not making them healthy because if they were making them healthy, they wouldn't need me. And so we have to talk <laughs> about, well, what are your real goals? Like, what do you want out of life? What's really important to you? What matters and why does it matter? Because, you know, one of the big trends is we see very high functioning, very high achieving, very driven people coming into work with us. And they've got, you know, they've got money, they've got status, they've got, you know, the picture perfect family, they've got the cars, they've got the this, they've got the that, and they say, but I don't have my health, right? And then we say, okay, well, you got to change this, 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 and this, and you got to do this, this, and this. And they're like, well, I don't have any time to do that. So what am I going to do? And we say, well, you got to think about mm -hmm. what your priorities are. And the other piece of that that I know that's going on is that if their health is not getting the attention that it needs, then their kids, their wife, their husband their aunt, uncle, mother, father, grandparents, whoever, they're also in need of some kind of TLC, love, attention. Um, because you can't, when you don't have time for yourself, you really don't, you don't really have time for other people. And there's lots of people out there who are overextending themselves, over giving, over caring, lots of moms 
who, you know, they were, their tank was on empty, like, you know, six exits ago, but they just keep going because they're moms and they like, a lot of them don't have kind of like an off switch. And we need to talk to them like, Hey, is there some kind of way we can get somebody to help you have some time for you? Um, because you're really burning your health down and you know, you gotta be there for your kids, not just right now and not just next week, but next year, next decade, et cetera. Um, and that helps a lot of them. But what I've realized too, is that sometimes we're the only people in their lives telling them that everyone else mm. is coming to them with another <clears throat> problem that needs to be solved with another, you know, um, uh, issue that needs their attention with another, you know, hurt, you know, pain. Uh, uh, problem, right, that they need to fix. Mm. You sort of mentioned before around uh, like chasing chasing numbers on a blood test. I'd love to oh, yeah. I'd love to dive deeper into that because that's something that I've noticed as well. With I've seen guys that are like looking at their blood test results and they're them you know they're looking at their ratio between estrogen and testosterone and. Mm. They're like, oh, well, if I get it to this number, all of a sudden I'm going to feel like this. But I'm like, that's not exactly They're how so it works. so labile. Like, have you ever done your blood work like multiple, multiple times in one month? Uh, I've done like twice a month max. But yeah, there, there's okay. definitely, it definitely does fluctuate. There's a lot of play. So I did mm. this as an experiment this summer. I did, I did like four rounds of the exact same panel. And I went through this, I, I, it's my view, the YouTube video for this is Dr. Shulman, Dr. Shulman, Dr. Stillman shares his personal labs. And I go through and I'm like, look, some of these numbers, it's like train tracks, like nothing makes my IGF one move from what I can tell, you know? <clears throat> and, uh, but my vitamin D, right. There's like a 20 or I think it's a 10 point difference between my December and then my summer values, even here in Florida where it's pretty sunny all year. And, uh, then there's other values, right? Like my, I think it was my T3, you know, my T3 fluctuated by like 20 or 30 points, which is about 25%. Was that, right? was that with the same exact same nutritional, same diet, same lifestyle, wow. same house, same sleep routine, sl same work, same daily schedule, same morning, same cup oh, of coffee, same coffee shop, same composition <laughs> of the cup of coffee same honey with a little bit of almond milk. <laughs> <laughs> the exact same barista, the exact same barista. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like I might've changed the brand of toilet paper that I use, but I don't know. And so it's like, you know, and people get really fixated on these numbers, but when, when, when they do that, that's when I start to ask them, like, how do you feel? Mm. You know, how do you feel about you? How do you feel about your life? How do you feel about your relationships? And a lot of the time we get into the there's something like driving them. There's something eating them. There's something really bothering them that they have to address. That's where getting them into mindfulness, meditation, silence, relaxation, things like float tank, um, sauna. And then, you know, Jim, Jim's my lead health coach, Jim Laird. If people, he's really smart. He just did a great podcast with a guy named Eric Karem about recovery and exercise and stuff like that, that I'm sure your listeners will get out a lot out of. And Jim, recently got into neurofeedback and EMDR. And then I followed him and was like, I want to try that. So I started neurofeedback and neurofeedback has been amazing. Better mm -hmm. focus, better mood, uh, more productive, better ability to make decisions and also work with my, my team, you know, cause I had, a, I had one employee a year ago and now I have like, you know, I have two full-time employees and like ha half a dozen subcontractors. So, um, you know, it's, it's one of the things that we actually recommend to a lot of our people is this brain retraining. Cause it's, you know, you think nothing of going to the gym to train your body and yet you don't ever go anywhere to train your mind. Mm. And it's not that meditation's not good. It's not that Tai Chi, you know, Qigong, a lot of these ancient practices aren't good. They are, but you know, there's a big difference between, well, I would just say there's a lot of value in things like neurofeedback and EMDR, in addition to those things for helping your, mm. your brain, you know, um, it, for many of those people, they need to switch off. They need to relax because that chasing that, that, uh, detail, that ratio in the blood work or on whatever lab they're measuring is, uh, it's just something that can distract them from the things they don't want to think about that bubble up mm. when they are not focused on something outside of them. Mm. What about, 
when people are brand new to the health optimization space and they come across the word biohack, um, wh- how do you think people perceive that word? And in your eyes, how is that word being used either appropriately or inappropriately nowadays? <laughs> That's an interesting question. I think that when people think about hacking, they think about getting into a computer system first, right? And changing something potentially in a malicious way. And then I think what it's come to mean in modern life is um, how to do things better and faster for a better result. And then, you know, put the word bio on that. And obviously it's, you know, getting better life results faster, right? (laughs) What I think people, where I think they get into trouble is not understanding that nature's got a reason for its pace and its timing. Um, and there's a lot of things about your biology that you shouldn't try to accelerate. We're doing really exciting things with accelerating things in, uh, in the biohacking space. Like, you know, you could look at something like neurofeedback and you could call that biohacking. Like, I certainly know for a fact that, and it's not just me, like my whole staff has mentioned that I'm, I'm more effective as a person. <clears throat> but you look at that, that's very much a biohack and it's been immensely helpful. And I don't know if I ever could have gotten the same result without it, but I won't, I obviously can't know. When yeah. they say um, like effective, they mean like your productivity output sort of thing or? Productivity, ability to handle multiple you know, tasks and things at the same time, my ability to interact with people and negotiate with them, talk to them, work with them. You know, there's a big reason why doctors tend to be very difficult for people to talk to. It's because the training they put us through is very um, malignant. There's a lot of just ugly personalities in there, and there's a lot of there's a lot of abuse in the medical system that people don't uh, see <clears throat> because it's not talked about, and, and because it's not um, you know medical trainees are very much like they're very stoic, just like soldiers. It's like you're not supposed to whine, you're not supposed to complain, you're just supposed to shut up, play ball and save lives. Um, just like in the military, it's like, you're not supposed to feel your feelings right now. You have to go out and, you know, kill enough of the enemy that we win or whatever. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been a huge uh, game changer for me, but the funny thing about that is that I, I don't know how much credit I should give it because I'm doing all these different things at the same time. Like these patches that I have, these life wave patches, have you heard about these? Yeah, we had the, um, something Anderson, I can't remember his first name, but he was on, he was actually on my podcast. Oh, cool. Did you, have you tried them? I've, they're sitting in my shelf and I, <laughs> just like with all the other biohacks that I've got, it's like, I get it somewhere there. I still haven't had a chance I know to try what you mean. it. Yeah. Well, it's really fun going to visit like Ben Greenfield. Cause you'll like, I, I come, come into his, into his living room where he works in the morning and he's got like stacks of boxes and books. Yeah. And I'm like, is this every day? He's like, yeah, every day. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, but listen, I get rave reviews about these things, um, as just one. And, and one of the things that people tell me is that their brain fogs better, their fatigues better. I just had a patient today whose son, I gave him some patches and his son, he said, he's in a much better mood all the time and he's much more upbeat about life. And he doesn't know what else to attribute it to than the patches. Cause the reality is I sent him the patches cause the guys the, he had a, a really serious foot trauma that may actually result in some of one of his foot bones dying. So it's not like he's in a life situation that would make him normally feel more upbeat and happy. So that, and then I, there, there's a YouTube video where I interviewed somebody who recovered from lupus. She had a lot of neurological complications from that severe brain fog, fatigue, um, that's on my YouTube channel. I can't remember the title of it. So, you know, I did, I started the X39 patch like three months ago. I did, um, I, I stacked that with the carnosine patch, the sleep patch, the X49 and, uh, the Aeon patch, all giving me these great synergistic results that I see the days that I don't wear them and then see return the benefits return when I, when I do wear them and I see them build the more I wear them. And then on top of that, um, you know, I was doing new mineral balancing protocol. Have you ever checked out the work of Dr. Paul Eck? The name rings a bell. Does he do, is he like a mineral? 
He's no longer he's with us. Less, he's uh, the, he's oh, the wait, godfather yes, I have, I have of hair tissue him, mineral yeah. analysis. So I got into hair tissue mineral analysis about a year ago and kind of slowly got more and more into it as I began to realize that it was more and more powerful than I had appreciated and that I had been led to believe. And then I just launched a hair tissue mineral analysis course with my friend Clark Engelbert. And we're training like 30 different people in how to read these tests and understand the mineral system. And we're just, people are really happy with the course, which is awesome for us. Um, and we're looking forward to enrolling our next cohort in end of October, 2023. And then we're going to have a level two, uh, for people who want to progress. And I started doing mineral balancing really in earnest back in July, where I really, I didn't just use protocols that I'd put together based on my functional medicine training. I just said, look, Clark, what do you think I should do? And what was really interesting about that is the doses of zinc that I, that he told me to take. So you know, I was trained that, well, first of all, in conventional training, I don't think I ever once prescribed zinc. And then I got out into the functional medicine world and you get people throwing zinc at, I mean, everything, but then they're also throwing every other mineral under the sun at everything because, you know, it's like, it's just, you can find evidence for these minerals to treat practically every disease. And Linus Pauling did say, Linus Pauling, double Nobel laureate, he said, you can trace every disease to a mineral deficiency, full stop. So anyway, but what's but the tough thing about minerals that people don't get is that they have these antagonisms and synergies. And so, you know, you give somebody too much magnesium and maybe you mellow them out too much and you don't give them enough potassium and they don't have any energy and you give them too much salt to potassium and all of a sudden they have high blood pressure. So you have to understand these things and Eck got deeper into this than anybody else maybe ever has probably because he saw so many patients. But um, anyway, I went on this protocol and I'd learned in my functional medicine training before working with Clark that um, you don't want to go over like 30 milligrams of zinc a day because it can cause imbalances with copper and manganese and other, you know, divalent metal cations. And then he said, look, you got to take 22 milligrams of zinc three times a day, plus a little bit extra in a multi-mineral multivitamin. And I did that. And wow, I mean, what an immediate effect that was very, they're very consistent for like two or three months that I was on that protocol. And that was when I really woke up and thought, this is really way more powerful than I'd even thought. And that was even though I'd been getting great results with the hair tissue mineral analysis, not knowing all these ins and outs, but just looking at these levels and saying, wow, that this person's really low on selenium. This person's really low on chromium. This person's really low on, you know, manganese, molybdenum, et cetera. Um, and then you doing what we call replacement therapy, where you see a low, you treat it, right? So that's what we have this course on now. And I've never gotten better results. We're getting more and more repeat HTMAs back in the practice now. And it's pretty remarkable. You know, I put together a series of three today where aluminum levels, you know, one aluminum level went from one to 12. Another one went from like 0.5 to like 20, another one went from like one to five. So we're seeing, you know, people quintuple the amount of these heavy metals that they're eliminating and they feel much, much better as they do this. So it's, you know, it's correlating with improvements clinically with also with these big excretions of metals on their hair, in their hair. I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about the, um, yeah, obviously the HTMA testing, we spoke about that very briefly in naturopathy schools, very, very brief, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm curious to know, like these aluminium. Uh, I love the way you guys say that. <laughs> uh, aluminium. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these are uh, these are uh, clients that you saw very high levels of this particular heavy metal. Um, yeah. What did you determine to be with the main source for that? I'm not going to say, or we'll get, we'll get canceled. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> Are you surprised? Jeez. Really? Jeez. You're not surprised. Uh, I, I heard rumors. I'm not going to mention it. I'm worried we're going to get censored. <laughs> I know, right? Dot, dot, dot. Jeez. Foreshadowing, foreshadowing, foreshadowing. Stay tuned Jeez. for part two. <laughs> no, so there's a lot of aluminum in our modern world. You know, underarm deodorant, personal care products, aluminum containing pots, pans, aluminum foil. I mean, aluminum is in so many different things. Um, 
and people don't think about it. Like w- one of the first big aluminum levels that I got back, um, was a, uh, the woman I mentioned earlier and she'd been taking this, you know, functional food. It was a seed preparation in an aluminum packet that had like a gel coating in it that was supposed to protect it from the aluminum. But I said, look, I can't, I don't see another source of aluminum in your environment. How do I know this isn't coming from this, you know, packaged food that you're consuming? And I mean, to, you know, to be fair, I'm not even sure the packets are aluminum. They just have like a shiny inside interior metallic looking coating. And what else is that going to be? It's not like they're packaging this stuff in steel or tin or anything like mm. that. So I just assume it was aluminum and I, who knows how much of it's leaching into that product, but that's a big problem that we have. You know, I mean, I don't know what the aluminum concentration is in, I don't know, light beer or if that is different than it is in an IPA. Uh, I know I saw a big aluminum level in a, I mean, over a hundred in a, in a CEO who was relying heavily on energy drinks. And, um, you know, I, I saw that and I thought, wow, we got to get this guy off energy drinks. So what I did was I actually told him, look, you're going to buy these powders and you're going to use them to make what I now call functional medicine mocktails where you take a bunch of these different things you need to, to basically fix the patient's brain chemistry, a certain direction. Right. And you mix them up and that's their substitute for an energy drink. And I coach my people on that. Like they want, they, they'll, I'll go through a, you know, history taking with them, coaching them, whatever. And I'll say, look, you should use this, this, and this, and how much and how often. And I'd, I'd, you know, mix it with, you know, cranberry juice or beet juice or whatever. I don't actually have to admit, I haven't used beet juice because I don't think anyone would do that, but um, I'll pick the juice or pick the, 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 even the source of water, you know, we can get kind of fancy with that because you could use like a reverse osmosis filtered water and then add concentrates or trace element solution. That's heavy in magnesium. If you didn't want to get the calcium in there, or you could use the spring water, which has got the calcium and the magnesium. So you can do all kinds of things like that. So, uh, anyway, yeah, that's, I mean, there's so, so many sources of aluminum in our modern world and, mm. uh, it's, it's, you know, Chris Exley's work on this is very clear. Aluminum is a big, big problem in the human body. Uh, but that's mm. a very hot take for yeah. obvious reasons. S- switching, switching gears. I mean, I'd like to, um, delve into sleep and stress. I know you mentioned mm. before around, um, you know, stress being a heavy component of, yes. um, the people's issues with health. How do you go about, obviously, People are aware that they're un- they're under stress. Some, most people, you'd assume, are, are aware that they're they're feeling stressed. But then, how do you go about as a as a functional medicine you know, practitioner expert in regards to um, assisting them with either coping with their stress or or actually reducing their stress? Number one is figuring out where they are. So first of all, is there time and space in their day for them to relax? Because a lot of them will tell you flat out, no, you know, my feet hit the floor and I have five minutes in the morning before the kids get up and I'm lucky if my brush, if I brush my teeth before they're asking me for breakfast. Right. And you know, that's just one example, right? Uh, you'll get other examples. You know, the, the person who's got a absolute monster job, they work 16 hours a day every, you know, meal is takeout or delivery, or, you know, if they're lucky, maybe they get home in time for a home cooked meal once in a blue moon. Right. So if there's no time and there's no space and there's no rest and relaxation, there's too much stress and you're going to hear it in their voice. You're going to hear it in how they describe their day. Somebody who's, you know, I have a, a patient, she's retired. She lives on a golf course in Florida. Her husband plays golf all day. She does whatever she wants. She has plenty of time. Um, she's never talking to me like she's pressured or she's anxious or whatever. She has anxieties about her health problems. But if I told her, look, you got to take a two hour nap every afternoon, she'd say, well, I don't really know if I actually want to do that because that's too long of a nap, but I have the time to do that if I have to. Right. So, you'll see it in people. You'll pick up on their body language, their cues. And the more stressed they are, generally speaking, the more honest they're going to be with you or that like you tell them they need to take 30 minutes to sauna or 
meditate or do some breath holding or whatever. And they're going to look at you like, like you must not have kids or, you know, isn't it nice to be a wellness doctor where you can make your own schedule and you have time for that kind of thing. Right. Uh, so you'll figure that out. I mean, they'll, they'll tell you. And then, and then for the people who say, I, there's no way I can do that. There's no way I have time. It's not possible. You have to kind of get into a why, because a lot of them have really serious issues with their self-worth or really serious issues with a mindset of scarcity and lack and not having enough. Right. And you'll say to them, well, you know, why can't you take 20 to 30 minutes to sauna? And they say, well, I just don't have time. Well, why don't you have time? Well, I'm taking care of X, Y, and Z. Well, why are you taking care of X, Y, and Z? Well, because I have to do them. Well, why do you have to do them? Well, because I have to do this, this, and this, and this. And you know, if it's work, people are generally working to make more money and they're generally working to make more money so that they can afford more things. And so you say, well, why do you, and it was really funny. Once I had a patient say to me, I bet you have a really nice car, Dr. Stillman. And I said, no, I drive a 2020 Honda Civic because I don't want to spend my money on a car. I would much rather have an extra 30 minutes to an hour a day when I can rest, relax, and maintain my health than work more and have a you know, fancier car. And you know, people in our people have a tendency to want to chase more. And that's created a world of incredible abundance materially, right? We've never had so much material wealth ever in the history of the world, I think, than now. And a lot of that wealth is on paper, right? It's, you know, the Federal Reserve literally just adds dollars to its balance sheet and all of a sudden money's been created, right? But I mean, in real terms, you know, I mean, there's just more material wealth, goods, houses, hard assets in existence right now than ever before in the history of the world, right? And yet people have arguably never been sick or sicker, I should say than they are now. So the material mm. wealth we're chasing because we're wired for a world where famine, drought, you know, war, enslavement, natural disasters, these are normal everyday occurrences. Our brain, our, our primitive brain, you just kind of can't wrap its mind around the fact that we can build grain silos that can withstand hurricanes, you know, or we could store you know, enough food to feed in a family of four in a broom closet for, and it could keep for 10 years. Our brains don't work that way. They think I need another thing. I need another thing. I need more stuff. And a lot of that's wired out of, I mean, some of this goes back. I mean, I, I wonder about it, right? Like I remember reading, not reading, I was watching a presentation long ago. I think I was even in college about how a famine in Ireland had epigenetic effects on Irish women to that turned on basically genes that made them more metabolically efficient and caused them to store more fat and that they saw this increase the risk of obesity in their offspring. So a famine wow. that a mother lives through sets her child up to be more overweight, right? That's what our genetics are wired for. Not this world of just, you know, I could, I could in five minutes, I could have, you know, uh, milkshake in my hand that came from a cow in California. Then another five minutes I could have, you know, chicken McNuggets or whatever that were made in Georgia. It's a very bizarre in an evolutionary sort of, you know, um, natural sense. And our brains are not set up to cope with that level of abundance, which is why we have so much obesity and diabetes and not just those things, right? Because I think those are the things that people see in public. And, you know, if there's one thing that, that, that is probably the, 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 that crushes it more than anything in the health and wellness space is a topic. It's fat loss, weight loss, mm. but just as, as dangerous and problematic are the, the things that people don't see the gluttony of things that is not food, the drugs, the exercise. I mean, most people don't realize that you can really truly be addicted to exercise. I have had cases in my practice where exercise is one of the big problems. And it goes back to the diet thing. You know, the best diet you have is one that you don't realize you're on. What's funny about it is that, you know, people will not realize that their diet they think is adequate for their caloric needs for their exercise load. And they're completely wrong because no one, they don't, they don't have any context. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, other things, you know, we look for drugs, we look for 
dysfunctional relationships. A lot of people who don't have time for themselves are stuck in relationships with narcissists, psychopaths, whether that's a boss, a parent, spouse, romantic partner, child, whatever. It's then pulling their energy out of their body in a very real way and setting them up for the failure that they then come to us for help with. We've had, you know, more than a few people who say, wow, you know, the way you talked about this topic helped me understand that I needed to end a relationship or get out of a, a, a toxic work environment. And it really, that then all my medical problems disappeared. Right. So. Yeah. That's, um, I have a name for those. I call them energy vampires. Um, those people who tend to, you know, they, they drain your energy, not, not boost your energy and, and vitality. Um, right. That was actually going to be my, my, my next question, which was around. And the final question, which is what is your number one bar hack for increasing energy? <sighs> wow. Number one biohack for increasing energy. Um, this is going to sound maybe kind of lame, but increasing rest. I mean, people need to rest. And the people out there who are listening to this and saying, you know, I can't get out of bed. I feel like I've been resting for the last two and a half years. My parents want to kick me out of the house. What do you mean I need more rest? A lot of people are not aware of the things that are draining their energy. So for example, I've had many patients where they were sleeping on the wrong side of a wall from a smart meter. And so even mm. though they're spending a lot of time in bed, they're not getting good sleep. And then, you know, they have all these other health problems that creep up. You know, I, this, the first case of this that really, really, you know, struck me was a pharmacist living in a rural area. She's sleeping on the wrong side of the wall from the smart meter. She has horrible food intolerances. Her functional medicine lab testing is a disaster. She has tons of mineral deficiencies, B vitamin deficiencies. Turns out that, you know, getting her to sleep on the other side of the house, immediately her sleep improves. Immediately she's tolerating more food. And this just built over weeks and months until she didn't need to call me again. Now, there was one more thing in that picture that was really important, which is that she didn't realize that her well was poisoning her. She didn't have a deep enough well, and it was contaminated with E. coli. But Jeez. you find these things, right? And then finally, you rest, and your body has the nutrition or the quiet. You know, Because I look at, at quiet and rest, it's... You need to have an, a, a, an environment that's quiet and clean. You got to have clean air. You got to have clean water. You've got to have a lack of sound, a lack of visual stimuli, and a lack of electromagnetic frequencies, which increasingly as people, you know, nobody noticed EMF that, well, much in the days of like the brick cell phone, you know, the cell phone that was like the size of a, of a brick, um, but now with, I mean, just the sheer amount of EMF that's getting pumped out of our modern consumer electronics, it's much more common to find sleep disturbances that resolve when you get rid of those devices, or at least just have them in the other room or across the room, you know, that the patient's sleeping in. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic stuff there. I mean, there's definitely um, a range of things that you brought up that I'm really keen on exploring perhaps we'll have to organize a a second follow-up podcast to go over some of these other um, things that you've mentioned but i want to i really want to give my ch my listeners a chance to if they want to connect with you um, where can they find you where can they you know consume your content um, let them know so the best thing to do uh, is to sign up for my newsletter at stillmanwellness.com you get access to a free monthly or sorry, free weekly webinar through that. That's only for people on the newsletter. Uh, you'll get updates on our courses and things like that through the newsletter as well, as well as podcast appearances, et cetera. Um, and then I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. You just put in my name and I'll come up most of the time. My handle is Stillman MD and, uh, yeah, that's the best way to get in touch with me. And then if you're interested in becoming a patient, it's stillmanmd.com. Fantastic. We'll uh, make sure to leave those linked in the in the show notes. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it's great to great to have you on the podcast. I know um, a few of my 
you know, followers on Instagram have sent me your content and told me I have to get you on the podcast. So yeah, it was great to connect. Cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for having me. Awesome. And that should be all wrapped up. Gee, uh, yeah, just stay in the room for a sec because I think it's sure. still uploading. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. That was awesome. That was really fun. I think um, we'll probably have to get you back on 